We have Gaurav Bhattacharya on the podcast. Gaurav is the CEO of Jiva.ai, an incredible entrepreneur, a CSULB alum, and an awesome guy. Thanks for making the time. Yeah, absolutely. It's such a pleasure. I'm very excited to be here. And thanks, thanks for calling me. Thanks for, thanks for inviting me. It's an honor to have you. So, Gaurav, before we get into the interest of days of the episode, what's your journey been like? Yeah. Oh, um, should I start from the very beginning, or what, what, do, you, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. All right. So, so I'll give a brief background about myself. I grew up in New Delhi. I come from a very humble, grew up in a very poor family. I think uh, my dad died of cancer when I was two, uh, but I had an awesome mom. She worked super hard to make sure we always had, you know, she wanted she she wasn't that educated, so she wanted to make sure that her kids, uh, me and her brother, were educated. So she worked very hard for it. Um, I remember my I have an older brother who's seven seven years older than me. And uh, he was a very geeky kid, so he was super ex- excited about coding and programming. So when I was about 10 years old, I remember he bought an old Windows 95 PC home and he put it together. Uh, and I just remember like playing with it, getting together. So that was my excited, I got super excited with computers. And I think that was my beginning of like coding. I started coding when I was 10 years old, uh, but my first video game at 12. So uh, I was an introverted kid growing up, so I spent a lot of time home just like on the internet, on, on playing video games, coding. Uh, yeah, so that, that's been kind of my journey. And uh, on to my, what would you call it, like a third startup now. So super exciting times, you know, but uh, always have been close to like coding and computer science for me. So you did a, a degree in aerospace. I did, yeah. How did that come up? Yeah, you know, like uh, actually it was a, uh, yeah, not the best answer, but, <laughs> but, the, but the reality is I had a dare from a friend and so, so we had a friend whose uh, whose sister had studied aerospace aeronautics engineering, um, and uh, and she was the smartest person we knew. So my friend would always make fun. So I, so I have a very bad habit of like I'm very opinionated about everything, and, and all my coworkers would call me that too. I'm not always right, but I'm always opinionated <laughs> about every single thing, no matter what it is, from design to engineering to product to any every single thing. I have an opinion, and a very strong opinion for it. So my friend will always tease me and like oh you're not as smart as my sister and so when we were coding in the early days because we started our first company uh, very early right after high school when he was one of our engineers uh, and I always knew when I uh, go to school or I go back to school I'm gonna do aerospace aer- aeronautics engineering just to just to prove a point that <laughs> that you know that it's not rocket science I, I figured it out <laughs> yeah but I'm obviously very intrigued by by, by planes and aircraft and everything so I think that was very fascinating one of the things I really wanted to build I felt that there's a company that can be built around sustainable aircrafts and electric aircrafts um, and it's a very hard problem to solve even even now people haven't been able to figure it out but I spent a lot of time at Cal State Long Beach figuring that part out and I worked with uh, Dr. Eric Besnard I, I don't know if you, if you, uh, you know he's a very famous guy there he, I don't think he's no, he's no longer here uh, but he started a space company and, and he was my professor for many, many years and we tried to crack this problem together. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't figure it out and couldn't make it into a viable business, but that was like a really sweet journey to be on. It's incredible. And like engineering and technology in any way, like engineering and design, engineering and business, they're just so deeply correlated. Yeah, absolutely. 100% agree with that. I think engineering and design go hand, hand in hand. I also feel that product engineering design all three go very closely together. Now, uh, you know, like Elon Musk is a very uh, controversial entrepreneur, and some people love him, some people hate him. I'm not going to comment on that, but he always talks about how he has engineering product and design at all his companies, whether it's Twitter, X now, uh, SpaceX, or Tesla. They all sit together because he believes that like designers can design without having the engineer's perspective, and the engineers will know what to build properly if they're not very close to the product. Uh, and they all have to like work extremely closely together. They cannot be separate departments. That, that's super interesting. The engineering is it's probably one of the most interdisciplinary subjects just because like it, it just teaches you about not what to build but how to build. Exactly. Exactly the why behind it too, right? What's the why behind it? And then what are you gonna do and how are you gonna do it? I think that's very interesting. And I think no matter what engineering you pick, I I'm I'm a big feel what I've learned is that if you're if you're an engineer, you can pick up marketing and sales, but it's extremely hard to be a marketer or an, or an, or like a salesperson 
or sales student and do all of a sudden be like an aerospace engineer or a computer science engineer. And the, and the challenge is not because it's not learnable, but I think there's a skill set of problem solving and that DNA is very hard to have in like to learn these kind of technologies. I think it's not how hard it is, but I think it's more like do you have that problem solving DNA? And I think engineering teaches you that. Uh, I think that's been very useful. You know, like design thinking is just like a debate exactly. of engineering. Exactly, spot on. Yeah. So now moving to entrepreneurship and uh, and all the way to Jiva building all the other businesses yeah. and like we live in a time that's change and development are so synonymous with everything with AI. Yeah. And the speed of change is it's it's pretty wild. So today, how do you look at those same angles with a problem? Uh, oh wow, that's so interesting. I think I think there's a lot of pros and cons to AI, and I, I'm, I would be happy to talk about G one and the building. But just going back to like the early days and the formative years of like students and engineers and, and everybody else, right? I think the challenge now with artificial intelligence is, and I'm sure like you've seen this too, but but it's it's the, the it's not about the answer all the time. Like there's there's obviously a natural curiosity that kids have. I have a, I have a, a seven-year-old nephew and, and he has like a million questions. Every time I meet him, he always asks me about, last time he was asking me about like what happens when two black holes collide. And I was like, wow, what a deep question. Like I've not thought about this, you know, because then he thinks that, I, you know, I know the most about space. I'm very excited about it all the time. So, and, and I looked it up at ChatGPT and I knew the answer. But if you think about it, there's knowing the answer, but there's also like getting to the answer, right? And I feel like as students, when, when we were growing up, uh, if you think about it, our, our previous generation, uh, every generation has had like some breakthrough technology, right? Like I think if the, let's say like in the 80s or not 80s was computers and uh, people for the first time had computers to solve problems. Then we had the internet in the 90s and people had like the internet to solve problems. I feel the worst generation, unfortunately, got affected by two thousands for the social media, <laughs> right? But I think like this new generation is going to be the AI generation, and it's getting faster and faster access to, to knowledge, but that also inhibits problem solving. So I feel like it's there's a problem solving DNA that kind of goes away because you always know where to find the answer quickly and not necessarily learn and stumble upon new things, right? A lot of life is about just stumbling upon solutions and problems and, and opportunities and network. Like your friends are, you stumble upon your friends, right? You don't chat GPT or friends, right? You stumble upon the love of your life, right? Like, so I think like, I think those things are going to be harder. I don't know how society is going to evolve around that. It's interesting that you say that because it's Moore's law to a certain limit, yeah. but it's compounding with Moore's. Moore's law is, talks about the idea that yeah. uh, computing process, uh, the processing power of the computer yeah. chip uh, doubles every 18 yeah. months. Exactly. And that's yeah. wild compounding. <laughs> exactly. And it's been true ever since, right? Yeah. So Moore's law came out when he said that the, the number of computing that happens. So if you if you think about a, a semiconductor chip, it's the size of like seven nanometers. It's very small. It's like the breadth of your head. And there's new technologies now, which, which, which the black hole chip Right, that Nvidia is doing, plus like others, it's called like Seam Ultra Violet, but they're trying to make the size of the chip as small as two nanometers. And and if you think about it, the, I think the size of an atom is like 1.4 nanometers. So what's happening is now you have like millions of semiconductors, uh, structures and transistors inside this small chip, which is like the size of New York almost, right? So you have as many buildings in New York, it's like the transistors you have in a chip, which makes computing much faster, which almost means that in the future, your smartphone your smartwatch will have the same computing power to power like an entire Apollo mission in the 60s, for example, like your whole space mission to go to the moon and come back. That computing that was needed to make that happen can be like the same computing that your smartwatch has. So, I mean, that makes like things, there's obviously great application that right? you can have neural limbs, you can have like, you know, there's a lot of like things that you could do with it. There's a lot of like um, benefits to it. Um, but, but I think there's a lot of like cons to it too. I think what happens with the critical thinking, the, the, the empathy, the deep human connection that humans have, I think that's, that's gonna be really hard to replace, but I, we truly believe that 
maybe with AI or a lot of the other things are going to get replaced. So, you know, and, that, and that's happening right now. It's wild because like latency is zero, but exactly what what you said. It just sometimes that latency, that period when you don't have an answer, those two minutes, and it would take for an answer to a ridiculously complicated problem it gives you that thinking space to figure it out. Yeah, exactly. and just let your mind wander. Exactly. Exactly. Let your mind wander, <laughs> and. And that's that's going to be really interesting. Like even for our company and our product, um, obviously we're building an AI app application. But um, what we are seeing is that that even our code, like even coding, is seventy five percent is now machine generated, and and that's that's good and, and bad. <laughs> you know, like engineers, even engineers don't think deeply about solving something because ChatGPT or Copilot, like there's GitHub Copilot, there's other solutions out there. Uh, yeah, so very interesting dilemma. Yeah. It's a wild time. Yeah, it's definitely a wild time. And the rate of learning is so fast that right? there's almost a new model, new application, new like way of doing things has been the fastest that I, at least I have ever seen. Uh, yeah, and it's wild because like just the, like it's 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 we're getting to the time when change is becoming finally reaching that exponential mark. It's no longer linear. Yeah, and it's just because it's just so hard to predict the development between say GPT one and GPT two, which were public, but like up to GPT three, mm -hmm. and the derivative of like GPT three to GPT four, the difference just blows my mind. And four again is the public version, let's yeah. say. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah, totally. So talking about Giga yeah. and what was the so being a serial entrepreneur? having built companies primarily around tech and engineering. Mm -hmm. When you were looking to move, and I know that Jiva, Jiva came out of a pivot, yeah. so how do you look at that process of build, while building and changing and pivoting? Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very hard. It's very hard. Um, uh, it's, it's definitely not easy. Because you, um, so, so we, had a, we had a product initially and, and a company, and we spent you know, a lot of time and effort on it, and it's kind of like a baby, right? So, so it's very hard to, if it's not working or if it's not where you want it to be, it's a very hard process overall. Uh, but Jiva was very interesting. So, so we had a, so during our last company involved, um, which was also an AI company, but in a very different space. So we had built a product internally. A few of our engineers had built this product, and they called it R two D two. And and this came out from we are Star Wars fans, of course, you know, and, and obviously you can keep the name as much as you wanted to. Um, but with R two D two, the whole premise was that there was a paper that Microsoft wrote a few years back. I think I think about eighteen or nineteen months back, and it was called Auto GPT. And the whole premise was that can AI chain itself? Can we can we build it in such a way that can we have tasks that it can do on its own? Can it almost query itself like? You know how you go on ChatGPT or Gemini or Bard and you say, you, you keep prompting it, can it prompt itself? Which is like OpenAI just trying to release its own reasoning model, which is based on very similar fundamentals. And we got super excited by the idea and we wanted to apply it somewhere and we, fought, we wanted to apply it in our own sort of operations. So we built like a few scripts uh, to be able to do this for sales and we were just using it internally. So when, when we decided to move away from involved and move to a new different thing, we thought about the amount of work we had done and the, 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 all, the, all the amazing insights that came out of it. And, and we decided that, hey, maybe this is the direction we want to go into. So when Geo was created, our vision is that anything that requires deep human connection, like us connecting right now, strategic thinking, brainstorming, like the, we don't think AI will be able to replace that for many, many years maybe 50 or 100 years. But anything else that, especially like manual repetitive tasks, like labor intensive tasks, we definitely believe, believe AI will do better, faster, cheaper than humans. And that's kind of what we're trying to build. So our hypothesis is that we're trying to build these AI employees and build a framework, and especially to empower small businesses. And because there's a lot of smaller companies out there who do not have the capacity or, or they do, they, they're not funded by uh, they're not publicly traded, they're not funded, um, they are running on cash flow, and they don't have a bench that they can just hire. So let's say if a company has to double in size from like 5 million to 10 million next year, they just cannot go and say, we're going to hire 
12 more people, 20 more people. So our thesis was we had a, we had a, a few hypotheses around why this would be a good business or why we wanted to build this was one is we can empower a lot of small businesses. We truly believe in the power of AI. There's a lot of smaller companies that will be able to generate revenue, stay and keep keep stay stay profitable and compete with bigger companies, even without hiring hundreds and thousands of people, but just having AI agents and AI workers and AI employees. And a lot of the back office manual tasks from sales, marketing, finance, HR, recruiting, let's say like back office payroll management. We believe that all of these will be done eventually by AI, and this would negate the need to hire hundreds of people or five or 10 or 20 even people. So what this actually does is it grows the GDP of every country and it empowers small, because small businesses drive most of the economy, right? Like 80% of the economy and GDP is actually generated by small businesses, not by Microsoft, not by Google, but by smaller companies. So, so that's kind of what we wanted to create. So what we're doing with you guys, we're trying to build AI workers that can that you can program, that you can train, and they will work on your behalf at ten percent of the cost. And they, they, they it's not there to replace people, but it's there to like augment your workers that you already have and not need to hire five, ten, twenty more people basically. And that's kind of what we're trying to do is like how can you be more productive? How can you grow the GDP and your and your own profits without the need to like grow substantially or like how do you compete with big companies and there was a paper that I was reading but somebody had predicted I think Sam Altman had said this but he said that there's going to be a hundred million new small businesses that are going to get created just because people would have more capacity to get businesses off the ground with AI and, and I truly believe in that so so that was our kind of like the vision and the thesis behind GI. That's right like uh, so like uh, most people, companies think when, especially with pivots and all, companies kind of balance between the two approaches, going from product to market and going from market to product. Yeah. And being an engineer, it's oftentimes it's just like a double-edged sword because when you go from market to product, you're yeah. kind of seeing what a lot of people are seeing. And when you yeah. go from product to market, you're kind of assuming that the market is there. Sure. And as seen entrepreneur, I've been multiple yeah. businesses with the second approach, product sure. to market. Yeah. How, what like now when you deal with a pivot, yeah. what's your approach with at looking at the market, looking at yeah. an internal product that could go grow exponentially, yeah. and what the market's telling? Right. That, see, that, that's such a great point, and 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 I don't I don't know what the what the right approach is, but if you think about it, if you if you think about some some of some of the most famous companies, there's very few companies who's had an idea, and that worked out. That was their first idea. That so I'll give, I'll give a few examples. Like Google was actually not a search engine. Google was built as a middleware. They actually were trying to sell to search engines saying we have a better algorithm. And if you use Google's algorithm and our middleware, then we will help you rank better search results. And and that was it. And and, and they even they were so, so so close to landing their first customer. I think it was one of the most famous search engines and they, they had a conversation where they were in the room and then they search for something, and then the CEO of that company basically said, "If you just change the words a little bit, so so let's say it was something like like I'm gonna make something let's say Indian restaurants in Long Beach, and 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 they said that and the results were really good at Google, so they said that okay, if we just say like uh, cheap Indian restaurant in Long Beach that are highly rated, then I would get the same results." Basically, and then they negated Google's idea, and Google was like, "Okay, maybe we just build our own search engine to see if it works better." Um, Instagram's a great story, right? Instagram started as Bourbon, which was a, like a very social networking, location-based social networking app, and then the only thing pe that people were doing was like, like they were sharing uh, photos, pictures. Uh, WhatsApp was a great example. Too. I think that was just a, a it was a gaming company where they had like messaging was just one feature. Of the, of the app. So I feel like it's almost like that if we were talking about this, you almost like stumble upon it. Like it's very hard. Like I think there's like an MBA way of building a company where you actually go into a market and you do a lot of analysis and you say that here's a market, like let's say management consulting is a market which is growing 20% year over It's one of the fastest growing markets and it's one of the largest markets in the world. Another example of that is 
like energy companies, right? Like the energy is like a massive market. It's like a thirty trillion dollar market in the U.S. Maybe like fifty trillion dollar market in the world. Massive market opportunity. And a lot of people say, okay, it's a big market opportunity. The companies that already exist are really bad and really slow, and we can probably go in and disrupt it, um, right? But it's really hard to go from the market to into like a product and then make the product successful. Yeah, just a very hard thing to do. I think I think the best companies are probably built when they're trying to solve a problem that they face, and then and then it's just luck that when you're solving your own problem and you build something for it, and then there's other friends and other people who will use it because they have the same problem. I think that's been my approach after doing like all these trying to build great companies. What I've stumbled upon is like you just try to solve a problem that you know really well, and you can solve it, and then if you solve it, hopefully. Hoping that this problem is big enough, is growing fast enough, that there's more people who would be interested in it. I think I think that's been my my advice. I think it's really hard to go from finding a market opportunity and then saying that internet is like AI is going to be really big, right? Or yeah, yeah and then starting to like start something. Yeah, I think that's that's very hard to do. Uh, so now with your third company, your first company, your second company. How much? How how did your approach change between all? Yeah, I think a lot of learnings. A lot of learnings. I feel like um, uh, a few things that that we try to do now that we've learned from. Like one 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 of my learnings has been that if you there's many ways to grow a company. There's there's like sales. You can hire salespeople. You can hire. You can spend Google ads, Facebook ads, marketing dollars. You can do influencer marketing. You you can name like. 200 ways of growing, and they're all very expensive. The best way to grow, the best companies grow, is pure by word of mouth. Like, if you think about some of the best applications that you've used, it's like some friend who had nothing to do with that company came to you and be like, you've got to check this out. Like, this is the best car I've ever been. This is the best, you know, check, check out this thing called Google, check out this thing called Facebook, check out this thing called ChatGPT. I think that's so important. and. So we focus a lot, and that only happens when you can have like users or your, or your customers really, really love your application. Like they're your salespeople. Like it's such a cool thing, and it's not just about that being a better thing. Like there's a there's a I don't know who has this quote, but there's a whole old marketing uh, word group which says that new travels faster than better. Like a new thing is 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 almost like if you're if you're building something new, it's more exciting than building a better. Thing. Like a better Google is not as exciting, but a completely different way of searching would be like very exciting. I'm just making that up. So going back to it, I think we have a fundamental philosophy now that the best products win. You know, and we've had startups that have succeeded, start like products that have failed. And I think what we learned is like you cannot outgrow a bad product. And and even if the product if the product is amazing and people love it, no matter how much you screw up, it'll still work. So we focus a lot on building a product that people really, really love, and not just like like, but they love it. Growth is extremely important. Like right next to it is like, are you growing every day? It's so important to measure growth because there's a lot of excuses you can have, which could, which could be I don't have enough engineers, I don't have funding, I don't have product market fit. I just need six more months to build this and get this out. So from day one, we focus on actual paying users and paying customers, even if they're paying a hundred thousand. Five thousand dollars, right? Like whatever that is, like even if it's five dollars, but it has to be paid from day one because this way you know what people truly have an appetite for and what they would pay for. So growth is very important, and you're just talking to your users constantly, trying to get feedback and just build it as fast as possible. I think the last thing is getting hiring right is extremely important. I think one of the things I've learned is like the first ten people are the DNA of your company, and if you don't get it right. You just you screw up a lot. So I think those are my three top fundamentals. Like it's product, like make sure the product's really good, then focus on growing, and then also like the, the team. The team you build is a company you build. So I, it's extremely valuable. I think everything else doesn't matter. In my at least again again I could be wrong, but in my experience, marketing doesn't matter, sales doesn't matter, advertisement doesn't matter, what what law firm you work doesn't matter, which office you're in doesn't matter, what kind of computers you're using doesn't matter, right? What program are you going to use for coding? What infrastructure is you going to be like? What tech stack are you going to be on? Hundreds of these micro decisions do not matter 
as long as you're a great product, great team, and you're growing everything, and you're having new users. Like growth means you're either adding new users or customers, or you're retaining the users and customers you have. I love that. Especially for startups, it's like the bottom line matters much less than the top line. Yeah, the growth rate. Like Paul Graham, a Y Combinator, who had this beautiful line that kind of really resonated with me when you were mentioning this was that if you want to build something to replace an existing product in the market, mm. you can't be two times as better. You need to be, again, this is based on Y Combinator and having dealt with thousands of companies. Yeah. It needs to be at least 10 times better than the current company, which is a major and, part. And even better is if it's 10 times different. Yeah. <laughs> I think that different part is very, very exciting. One of the, the there's there's a, a, a really famous UX researcher which had this in their book, and and he was talking about that. Let's say if two two people are sitting together, let's say you're in a dinner conversation with a lot of people, and everyone's going around and just talking about the coolest thing, right? Like how do you become the most interesting person at the dinner table, and they're sh sharing like stories about like what's going on right who's the most interesting person they're, they're sharing something totally new and different that they experience that no one has has ever heard of for example right like if, for example if you come in and you say like hey i you know i have this like a german physicist that I sat with and the guy told me that he's found a way to go back in time and here's like proof now you're the most famous person right um, so I'm just talking about just talking about that philosophy was super interesting because if you build something very different, then if and if one person is sharing uh, information about to the other person, then there's no baggage. Like let's say for example, if I recommend a new service to you, right? Let's say if I came through a new ride share sharing technology right now, like you know I said that okay, you know like there's a new ride share app called you know, whatever, right? Like G G bump, right? Like and then it's basically like it's for long distance right sharing. And it's like basically like it's gonna come from like if you're coming from like two hour long distances, if you're traveling from Santa Monica to Long Beach, then it's it's really, really good. It's much better than Uber. You try it and you have a bad experience. Now you're like, oh man, that's pretty bad experience because it was it wasn't as good. But what if I told you that there's a tunnel that I found, right? Or there's a new technology that actually has a new tunnel and you just have to come underground for two hour long distances. So now, even if you try it and you have a really bad experience, I never told you that it's better. I just told you that it's something cool and new and exciting for you to try. Does that make sense? So, so one, of the, one of the hypotheses again is going back to saying that just build something very different and like almost like unique and I think you'll have a better chance of winning than by trying to replicate and trying to make something better that already exists. It's interesting because it's often times you also, it's kind of like you're building a new market. Yeah, in a way. Exactly. We're going after a market that is growing very, very fast. Rather than being very big. Exactly. It doesn't have to be very big in the beginning. Like if you think about Airbnb's market, Airbnb's market is was tiny, right? Like if you think about it, Airbnb's market was people who are gonna give you a room in their house and they, they didn't even have house sharing or you know so it was basically like it was called air bed and breakfast because it was it was air bed and breakfast for a reason it was basically if you have an extra air mattress and you wanted someone to crash they would pay you 20 bucks or 30 dollars to stay stay overnight and it's like the, the, if you think about the market size for that it's probably like 100 people yeah. <laughs> that are willing to have a stranger come in their house live on an air mattress and there's like 100 people who are probably willing to sleep on an air mattress for a night <laughs> so I think it's like you, you get a market and then you try to just make, hope, hopefully the market's like fast growing. I think fast growing markets are better than big markets. I'm a Brian fanboy anyway. Yeah, I, I love what they've been from going to a conference, just a whole, at, in San Francisco. And it's it's interesting because like they pretty much built, did exactly that, built a brand new market that, like I, I think they got like a ridiculous amount of rejections before they raised the first round to, uh, Totally. Um, so now when you, what about scaling up? When you're scaling up in a, in a market that you pretty much developed at this point, that yeah. a market that did not, like rather than going into a market that predominantly existed and you can yeah. go with the conventional route, again, that's moving like a big company would move rather than how yeah. a startup moves. Yeah. 
but now scaling up in these unique circumstances. Yeah. In in your years, what's been like a couple of things you learned from like scaling up in a market that's yeah. growing fast per se, not big. You kind of want to be with the wave, but you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. I think I think it's very hard to create a new wave, but it's very easy to ride once, right? And 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 I think the and that's why I love like college students. I think the. One of the things you've seen is whatever college students are doing now is usually what the wave's going to be five years from now. Like usually the early adopters of AI and chat GPT is like college kids. I think that that's a predicament of the future. And uh, uh, I don't know who it is, but there's someone who says like um, the reason that they did not invest in AR VR was because it wasn't popular amongst college kids. Like it was in college students were not. Facebook is a great example of like starting yeah. colleges. Um, so talking about scaling up, particularly, I feel that if there's a rate wave you're riding, it try to just go go for it. You know, like I think there's a lot of there's a there's 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 a lot of misinformation about startups. The, the misinformation that I've seen is it's wrong in both places. I feel that when you're a, when you are working on an idea, there's a there's a lot of money available for you because now now he's can access to capital is easy, there's incubators, accelerators, there's famous people who want to back on right? And in order, you can raise a lot of money, you can have a lot of people. And the challenge that happens is then you're not, you're not moving fast enough, you're not iterating fast enough, because you don't know what you're building. And for the first year, two years, and even like for whatever time, for some companies, they take 10 years to figure out a good product market fit, like, which means that have they identified a market that has a need and you have a product that fits that need. So the advice is stay as small as possible until you have good sign of the product market fit. But then the, there's there's counter advice which is also wrong, which is like scale efficiently, scale in a very linear fashion. And I think that advice is also wrong because once you find good product market fit, then I think you just hire as many people as possible. Right? Obviously, you can hire more people than you have cash flow for, and then grow as fast as possible. But you have to capture market. It's a race. It, a lot of these markets are, there's really strong network effects and monopoly effects. There's only one WhatsApp, right? There's only one Facebook. There's only one TikTok. You can think about anything, that, right? There's only one electric car company, Tesla. It's so hard to have like two or three or five players coexist in these technology driven markets. Obviously, Pepsi and Coca Cola will still exist 200 years from now and they'll still be as big. But the other thing, the other products have so so many such strong network effects that it's a winner take all market. So if you are in a market that you're creating and are just about to grow and you don't take opportunity of that, you could be, you know, the difference between the player number one and player two is massive. I think that's what it is. Maybe Lyft and Uber are probably the only two that are super close and competitive. But if you think of any big company or any big market. And tech or product or service that you use, there's usually a player number one, which has 90% of the market and is like a 10, 20, 30, 50 million dollar company. The second player is like maybe a 50 million dollar company, right? So th that's a big difference, right? The difference between Amazon and the second to Amazon is like massive, right? But when Amazon was being built, there were hundreds of Amazons. It's a winner take all market, so which means that, at least for me, when the advice that I was given is like you have to be very cautious, grow very efficiently, scale slowly. But I think once you know that something's working, you have to go for it, otherwise you'll miss out on it. And this, that, that's what OpenAI is doing. Why are they launching a new model every single day? Because Google's close to them, Meta's right behind them, right? Every single big company, Microsoft has their own models now. Every single company has Mistral, the Islam, right? That, that's Facebook's model, Meta's model. There's all these paid people trying to win it, and everyone knows that whoever wins the market is gonna have like it's gonna be a like a three trillion dollar company at least. And the, the one, the second one to it might only be a hundred million. That's that's how it markets work typically, because that's how markets work. And and especially like technology driven markets work like that. Like they have strong network effects. Software is like a really, really good example of it. So I think Unless you're building like a hardware company where you're making T-shirts and right, like, and that's not a bad business. I mean, there's something that you can build. Like you can build, build hoodies, custom hoodies, and there's going to be like fifteen hundred players who do this, and you, everyone's going to make a lot of money. 
Yeah, it's interesting. It's also relative that this amount of scale you can achieve in just sustainably the moat. Like you can't ever build that big a moat unless you are in a market that like certain markets just don't allow for a moat, like a t-shirt building mar- yeah. market. And like a moat can be such a big differential for any company. Yeah, totally. I think defensibility is extremely important. And I think that's something that I feel business school teaches that is not considered as valuable in like a non-educational environment. But you have to think about competitive differentiation, defensibility. And I think defensibility usually comes from three or four things only. Um, right? there's, there's network effects, which is like, if you add more people using the service, is it does it become more valuable? And phone calls are best way, right? Like I have to call you. The more people I have in my address book, the more valuable it is for me, the more valuable it's for you. Um, I think a proprietary technology is very important too. Like Google has a very secret sauce. It's very hard to build it. So if what you're building is easy to build, then everyone will build it. I think that's also, it has to be hard to build. Like it has to be have a strong barrier to entry. Otherwise everyone can replicate it overnight. iPhone is a great example. It was such a hard product to build that when it came out, Blackberry was like, it's gonna be horrible, right? Like they don't even have a keyboard. And then when they started replicating it, but others started replicating it, it wasn't that you could build it overnight. So it took them like three, four years to figure it out, but it had such strong network effects that by the time everyone else caught up, Apple was the only smartphone put in the space and they were like far ahead of anyone else. Um, the third thing would be like brand, right? I think brand is very important. All these all these clothing companies, I know we're talking about it, the Zara and all these guys, why are they so big? They're like a strong brand associated. Everyone's like, oh, their products, the forest products, or their makeup's gonna be better than whatever you get at CBS, <laughs> right? But maybe not. But but I think this brand um, and capital is very important, right? Obviously, like it's very hard to build a company without people having to pay you or having like some kind of capital that you raise. I think those are like the four things. I'm thinking of what else could it be? Right? Those are like strong defensibility or differentiation that you could have that any company could have and build on. So how do you know when your product market fit? Yeah, I I think it's such a hard question. It's like there's, there's multiple definitions of it. One thing that, um, there's an app called Superhuman, which is like an email platform. And there's a, there's a, the CEO is Rahul Bora, I think, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, but, sure. right? yeah. I mean, yeah. 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 So he talks about product market fit as being saying that if you had a, someone using your product and you ask them that if this company dies or the product goes away, are you gonna be uh, somewhat disappointed are you going to be not disappointed? Or are you going to be very, very disappointed? And he described part of market as like people, people should say, I'm going to be very, very disappointed. I'm going to cry if this product or service is taken away from me. And he believes that until you until have you have like many, many people saying that, then you don't have product market. Because if people are only somewhat disappointed, it can mean that your service is very easy to place for, for whatever reason. And superhuman is such a great example. But what a tough market, right? That yeah. they're going after because email is such a commodity product and it's free. It's a great product, but obviously even they are struggling. What I love about Superhuman is that they didn't try per se replacing email. Like you have to have Google Works. They're not. Yeah. It's not like you can just connect a POP server to uh, or connect your email to Superhuman and Superhuman will host your email. But you kind of have to pay for Google Workspace and then pay for Superhuman to connect to Google Workspace. Yeah. That's super interesting. Which is wild to me when I originally used it because it's like I don't need to pay 12 bucks but I need to pay 12 plus Google Works price. Mm-hmm. Or whatever the variable is. It's, yeah. it's wild because they kind of probably didn't go for the market of people who wanted to switch emails but for people who wanted something more than email. Yeah. They were totally. Like a more powerful email. <laughs> do you use yeah. I do. It's also awesome. a great product. It's definitely a great product. But it's a very tough market. I've even tried to like get a lot of my friends on it and then they're like, yeah, but Gmail or Outlook is just already so good. Like why, why would I need it? And now Gmail has like AI in their email already. <laughs> and see, that's also like a very tough thing, right? Like it's a very, I think email is such a big market, but it's, I don't think it's a fast growing market like it as it is, right? So it's such, a, it's such an interesting hypothesis. Even, even that, such a great product, such a great company, they can still fail. Which is very unfortunate, but it, it can happen because 
right? It's a commodity business so much, right? Like, I think, I think, I think going back to what I've learned is like doing, trying to do something different, right? If they had just created like a, a different app, like it's not email, it's like a productivity tool, right? It's like a Slack version or something. I think that would be super interesting then try to like replace email. That was a very bold vision, but it's extremely hard. Yeah, and it's interesting. I mean, it's, it's a big problem for a relative market, but it's interesting that they made it so far. I'm amazed yeah. by like, like the amount of effort it would have taken to just fight up the wave. Yeah, totally. So, for any student looking to build a company right now, what would yeah. be your advice? Oh, first company, first time founder. I would say, I would say you should start building. And I have, I have, I have a couple of couple of general advice. Let's say if someone's a high school student, I'm gonna start even earlier. What I would say is do not try to chase like entrepreneurship. And I think it's actually better for you to go to a regular school because there's entrepreneurial programs now, which I don't think is a good idea. Because I think a lot of like you falling. Like, so th there's, there was a case study where they even, I think YC did this, where they got 100 of the smartest founders they knew and really, really smart people. And they basically uh, gave them a lot of money and said, just go build, like find some idea and build it. And they all failed. And the reason is because you have to find a problem or like fall into the opportunity that you can, otherwise it's very hard to do. So I would say the first thing I would say is for high school students is like, go to a regular college, you know, find a great school, study a regular program, which is not entrepreneurship, but you're studying like engineering. Yeah, engineering, finance, whatever, math, physics, <laughs> right? Something that is not communications, but it's not entrepreneurship. Try to have friends, because a lot of like your early teammates are friends. And, and you start your companies with your buddies. That's very common for all the best companies to start by people who knew each other, because you need that level of trust then, uh, right? Because a lot of like students meet me and then they're always like, oh yeah, I'm always going to these meetup events to try and find the best. I was like, yeah, but I think it might be better if you just looked in your network and, and tell, you know, see who the smartest kids here, right? Like who go to school with you are. That would be one. And then the second would be, I think, like let's say for college students who are like third year, fourth year, or maybe like MBA students, second year, they're about to graduate. There's like a really, there's almost like a, a very easy out to get a job. Uh, and you can always push away your dream. Let's say you had a problem you wanna solve, you're gonna build a company. I think it's very easy to push away that dream and say, I'm going to first get a job and study and, and work for two years gain some experience, and then go build my thing. And what's gonna happen is in two years, you might you know, get promoted, and you might get more excited, and you might you might actually start enjoying what you're doing. Or maybe you're miserable, but you're now getting a, a weekly, bi-weekly paycheck. Now you have some more responsibilities, maybe you're sending money home, maybe you, are, you have to pay your bills, your lifestyle adapts, right? You're like, humans are like goldfish, right? So they always adapt to the environment there. And so now you, you're paying, you're, you're, maybe you buy a house, you're a mortgage, then you get married, your kids. Now it gets harder and harder and harder and harder to like take that leap of faith. So I think the best time to do it is like if you're if you're in school, start your company right then and there. Worst thing that can happen is you'll fail miserably. You can still go find a job. I love the word for something else too. That is so true, right? That is that's one of the best best ways to phrase it. I've ever heard of. Mm -hmm. it really do because you put someone. Most people like when you triple their income, yeah. their expenses triple too. Their Hyundai becomes a Bentley. Yeah, exactly. And savings and investments are two things that don't grow. And often that's just being there and being like, okay, I need this to work, and I really do, which is a different fire I think. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you so much for taking out the time. This was an honor. Absolutely, Carl. It was such a pleasure. I'm so glad that we could do this finally. Make it happen. Sit Absolutely. down and have a great conversation. Cheers. Awesome. Yeah, good. <laughs>